Okay. A very good morning to everyone. I hope your week has been a good one. Mine has been a very nervous one as I was preparing for this message. <laughs> um, so before we start, let us just um, pray. Father in heaven, I just want to give you thanks and give you praise, Lord, that we can come here every Sunday to worship you, to praise you, to give thanks to you. And Lord, even as we take this time now to learn from the book of Haggai, your servant, your prophet, I just pray the Lord, your spirit will reveal to us individually, corporately, the message that you want us to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, as Uncle Hong Seng has uh, introduced us, I have had the privilege, or having the privilege, to share with everyone this morning on the short book of Haggai. Only two chapters, not, but um, those are very important two chapters, uh, which is very relevant until today. So, allow me uh, to give you a very quick backdrop on the setting of the book of Haggai. So, for the book of Haggai, see um, similarities or comparisons with the book of Ezra. And if you have your time, in your time, own time, uh, you can turn to Ezra chapter 3 all the way to chapter 6, where it talks about the remnant, uh, roughly about 50,000 um, Jews, who returned from Babylon to Judah under the decree of Cyrus, king of Persia. And as they returned to their homeland, they quickly rebuilt the altar and began offering sacrifices. But two years after returning, where they laid the foundation to rebuild the temple, they had opposition. Okay? So Samaritans, or their neighbors, offered to join in on the work of the rebuilding. But the Jews refused their offer. So because of that, um, the Samaritans in turn threatened the workers and sent men to Persia to lobby against the Jews bringing the work to a halt. And this halt of the rebuilding of the temple lasted for at least 16 years. And what happened during that period of 16 years, the Jews or the Israelites uh, got caught up with the routine of life, right? Um, they carried on with farming, uh, building their own homes, raising families, um, that sort of thing. And they got used to life without the temple, all right, which is of great importance, but they got used to it. Even their leaders back then, uh, Zerubbabel, the governor, and Joshua, the high priest, also got used to things as they were. And so into that scene, because of the condition, God raised Haggai and Zechariah to proclaim his message to his return remnant. So I'll be dividing the two chapters into four parts. Right? Um, chapter one, the entirety of chapter one, I'll be talking about rebuke. Um, chapter two, expectations and discouragement. Uh, second one, call to faithfulness. And thirdly, a future hope. So if you have your Bibles, if not, you can look at the screen. Let us read Haggai chapter 1, verse 1 to 15. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. Verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. I emphasize again. They said, the time has not yet come to build, to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains in ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. And in verse 7, apologies for the... Uh, so, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin. While each of you busy, are busy with your own house, therefore because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. 
I call for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed. The voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the, of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedek, and the spirit of the whole remnant of people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. I think verse one is very short and concise, and it's very telling of the problems that the Israelites were facing back then, and the issue um, that God had with them. And despite the book being written close to 2,000 to 2,500 years ago, it is still very applicable today. And when Haggai says, give careful thought to your ways, it is like a hint or a warning. Even for us today, we need to consider all our ways. We need to evaluate our lives and ask ourselves, are we dissatisfied with our lives? So, do we then on occasion buy lottery tickets, thinking that the winning lottery tickets will solve all our problems? Do we buy then, uh, do we hope for a better paying job? I'm sure all of us do. Do we wish we lived in a bigger and nicer house? Do we all wish we had a new car? And if you notice, it is actually amazing how much effort we put into these areas, thinking that all these will satisfy us, but in actuality, it never does. And even in a church setting, remember the time when you came to know Christ, when you made a personal um, commitment to him. You decided to follow Jesus at first. You were passionate for spiritual things, you read your Bible every day, you got involved serving in church, but along the way, perhaps your efforts were met with a lot of difficulties, a lot of pushbacks. Um, you probably had a personality crash uh, with another believer, or you experienced um, disappointing results, or you have encountered um, personal trials where God didn't remove even after much prayer. Then from there, you know, life moves on. You started a career, a family, then after that, you know, bills start to come in. Um, and other demands for your time. The church and the Lord's work drifted into the background. You still attend church as often as you can, but it has become like a slice of life, not the center, not the priority. You tell yourself that you just don't have the time to serve as you used to. And on occasion, I do that uh, myself as well. Um, and sometimes you, you give that, that reason that perhaps someone else who does not have these kinds of responsibilities that I bear will need to get involved. Someone with, who has a freer time. So without intentionally, like purposely rebelling against God, you have actually drifted into putting your house above God's house. And where we read just now in verse two, it says, these people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. It's a pretty bold statement, I must say, um, as I read this statement, because despite knowing their issue, they dare say that it's not time to rebuild the house of the Lord. I think if, for example, this is not real, if I were to say that to my wife, Habis, I cannot. Family is important. Okay, so uh, you need to build up the family. But here, just for example, uh, it is the house of the Lord at that time, point in time that was neglected. And the Jews or the Israelites back then dare say that it is not time yet to rebuild. So hence the Lord was upset, was angry. That despite all that the Lord has done for them, still they neglected him. And what did the Lord do? Uh, so God then punished them 
uh, in verse 10. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have held their due and the earth its crops. But in the last few chapters of, uh, last few verses of chapter 1, we see a turn of attitude where Zerubbabel and his people obeyed God and the message given by Haggai. And God said, I will be with you. Thus began, they began to work on the house of God once again. So you can see it's a very turn, like a 180 degree turn of attitude uh, post Haggai's uh, rebuke. So a very quick summary of chapter 1. Um, the work of the Lord should never be procrastinated. All right? Misplaced priorities hinder the work of God. The goal of God's work is His glory and pleasure. And God sometimes uses natural disasters for spiritual discipline. Obedience and reverence are prerequisites for spiritual blessing. And it is never too late to start obeying God. When we put God's house above our prosperity, he is pleased and glorified. His work gets done and he blesses us. Let's now turn to Haggai chapter 2, verse 1 to 9. And I will break this uh, part of chapter 2 into two parts. So verse 1. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, speak to Zerubbabel, to Joshua, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? This house is the temple. How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Verse 6, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and what is desired by all nations to come. And I will, find, I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace declares the Lord Almighty. And I'd just like to focus our attention on verse 1 to verse 5 first. So we know that the Lord did not purposely or 100% ignore the reality of the situation. He knew what they were thinking and what they were feeling, and he brings it up now to show them that he understood that he cared for them. So for us as well, it's very important to keep in mind that in all our troubles, the Lord understands and cares for us. If we, don't, if we don't do that, we will easily become discouraged. And also, early on, there is always that certain sense of excitement when you begin a new ministry or a project. But that excitement can easily die down as time passes. So for the Israelites, the excitement of rebuilding um, the the rebuilding the temple once again could have been very high, very good. But perhaps, uh, you know, there could have been some piles of rubble that need to be removed. Perhaps some of the workers had envisioned putting finishing touches um, on some gold work or craftsmanship, but they didn't thought about moving the rubble. So initial enthusiasm can just fade away. And even, ah, sorry. Um, so before I go again, in Ezra chapter 3, verse 10 to 13, it shows that comparison that the older people back in, uh, in the book of Haggai experienced. So in verse 12, many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of the temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. So you can see there are two generations here, two generations of peoples here. The older one who had seen the former glory of um, God's temple before they were exiled to Babylon and a totally new generation seen uh, the former temple but are now laying foundations of the new temple. So one group is saying that, yeah, the former temple was so great. You know, you should have seen the glory of it and the scale of it is, of the current temple would have been a far cry from the uh, former one. And hence, you can see the 
or sense the sadness um, in them. And very quickly, because of what we have uh, I've shared earlier on or some discouragement uh, when we do our service, some of them sometimes can be loss of initial um, excitement. The other one is, let's say, delays. Um, let's say uh, if you want to plan to start a new ministry, um, there are delays for, no, I don't know what reason. Um, you could have outside opposition and criticism um, why are you starting this ministry? You think you have time for this, etc., etc. Um, inside pessimism, comparisons, and faulty expectations. Sometimes, you know, even as we start, um, there are cases when we start new ministries. Um, you know, how can you compare this ministry to back then? You know, the work back in let's say glory days of many other churches, uh, and then you set faulty expectations. And then, lastly, wrong view of success. Where when we start a new ministry. You always want instant success. You want to see the ministry grow instantly. Let's say um, a welcome ministry. Start with one representative. Then next week you hope. Uh, and it goes on and goes on. But then, and then you see as let's say week five or in two months time you have a team of 20 people. But then after that, things start to make a turn. Instant success is nice. But if you don't sustain or don't persevere on, people go move in and out. So it's important for us to learn, to be aware of this, and to always rely on Lord Jesus Christ. So as we move to the second part of chapter 2, verse um, 1 to 9, again, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace declares the Lord Almighty. So, what is this glory about? How can a new temple, which is supposedly smaller than the former one, have greater glory than the one in the past, when they have lost so much, even such as the Ark of the Covenant, right? The new temple did not have that. So, a hint of hope was provided, and let us read from Ephesians and also Romans. So in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 to 18, for he himself is our peace. Verse 17, he came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So the glory mentioned here is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ, the glory of God. And very quickly, a quick summary of this part of chapter two, courage and perseverance comes from knowing that God is present. It's important we realize that. The remedy for a discouraged heart is to see the divine perspective. Everything belongs to and is under the control of the Lord. And God assures us we, we are, when we are discouraged in serving him through his presence. He assures us through his presence, his promise, and his prophecy. As we carry on to the third part of Haggai's message, chapter 2, verse 10 to 19, a call to faithfulness. On the 24th month, on the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. Verse 12, if someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, the fold last time, you can see the, the drawing there, the fold, he was carrying a sack of grain. But in this case, imagine meat is inside there. Um, in this fold, bread or stew or wine, Oh, sorry, if someone carries holy meat into the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or any oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Verse 13, then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is it with these people that and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, 
And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. So going back to the questions that um, Haggai asked the priests, right? both answers were answered correctly. But essentially what the Lord is trying to say here is that the work um, of his people is unclean because despite them having that obedience to take the step to obey God, to rebuild the temple, what God is saying here is that their heart is not in the right condition. And hence why the Lord says, and what they offer there is unclean. And as we read, um, as we read here in chapters 12 all the way, I mean, chapter, verses 12 to 14, holiness does not come by contact. It is not transferable. But contact with unholiness does defile. Take for sickness, for example. If you are healthy and your spouse is sick with a flu, and you know you hug or kiss, will they will that make your spouse well? I think not lah. In fact, both of you will get sick or even faster. So it is the same with sin as well. We would think that you know you one let's say one of you are super holy, super righteous. You're not prone, I mean, you are prone to sin and temptation. And here it's very clear that God never desires a fancy building and lots of sacrifices if the hearts of the worshippers are not right before him. So while working on the rebuilding project, the confirm will be some people, if not many, who I'm pretty sure that if they, they thought that if they were to just get the temple rebuilded, or reconstructed, it will be like a good luck charm. Right? Since they rebuilt God's temple, he will bless them with a bountiful harvest, but their hearts were not right before God, and they were not drawing close to him. So it's important for us to reflect on this. It's our heart when we do service for God, be it in church or even outside um, your acts with your believers outside or with your non-believer friends, how are they? What's your heart uh, condition? What's your motive? Is it right before God? And in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. And this is on Saul. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And in verse 15, chapter 2, verse 15 to 19, Now then consider this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare when one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10? When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. In verse 17, I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. So again, in this uh, third message of Haggai, there is again rebuke. Verse 18, consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 to 9, it talks about God's discipline to his children. In verse 5, My child, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember, that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. And since we respected our early fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to, to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? Now, I'm pretty sure at least 
95 to 99% of us, we would have experienced spanking in one form or another. Either by hand, by belt, by cane, it is still a form of discipline. I have, right? My siblings have. Um, and I also pass this down to my two daughters. So, important, do not spare. Okay? Um, yeah, you want to know more, you can come, come to me. <laughs> uh, so, important for us to realize that discipline is important for us to draw back to our Lord Jesus Christ, to draw back to God. And remember that at times, you know, God's discipline is not necessarily directed to any specific sin, but rather sometimes it is to bring us to spiritual maturity. And I also attest to this, that sometimes when things are smooth in our lives, in our work, our career, um, wherever we, we may be, you know, we tend not to you know, trust God or submit to Him because, hey, things are great. Why, why do I need to further communicate with God? But it is with trials of this kind that forces us to rely on Him. And because we have nowhere else to go and sometimes no one to turn to. And in the case of the Jews here, the frustrations and hardships that they have been experiencing were due to their neglect, whether deliberate or unintentional of God's house. They had slipped into wrong priorities, putting their own pleasure and comfort at the head of God's kingdom. And that's why God sent his discipline to get them to stop and to consider their mixed up priorities. So, holiness is not transferable. Sin contaminates everything one does, so we need to be careful. Disobedience brings discipline, while obedience guarantees blessing. God will not bless a cause, no matter how great, unless the people involved are also righteous and holy. So the motive and the act of your spirit towards God needs to be right. And holiness that pleases God must also be inward and not just outward. So in the, in the first, uh, in chapter one, God will grant true blessing when we put his house first. And in this passage, God will grant true blessing when we put his house first with righteous living. And I come to the final part of the book of Haggai, chapter two, verse 20 to 23, a future hope. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers, horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. And on that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant, Zerubbabel, son of Sheotel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. So just a very brief background on who this character or Zerubbabel is. So as, as we know, as we read, he is the governor of Judah um, in the time of Haggai. He is the son of Sheotel, son of Je uh, Jehoiakim, who is actually of royal blood. So King Jehoiakim um, was his grandfather and was king of Judah and ruled when he was just 18 years old. But it was a short-lived rule, only three months and 10 days. But during those months, he did many evil things in God's eyes. And during his, it was during his grandfather's time that Babylon laid siege to Jerusalem and the family was taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar. And Zerubbabel was also the one that led Israel out of Babylon exile. Now to see how, um, why I bring up Zerubbabel is to see in Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 24 to 27. And this is the Lord um, speaking to King Jehoiakim, even you, if you, Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand, I will still pull you off. I will deliver you into the hands of those who want to kill you, those you fear, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the Babylonians. What is a signet ring? Now, you've probably seen in historical um, movies, you know, uh, the rings are huge. Right? Super huge and bulges. 
Um, so what the signal, signal ring symbol symbolizes, it symbolizes power, it symbolizes authority, it is used as a, a sign of contracts and used also as a seal. Now, we turn to Genesis chapter 41 uh, of a use of this signet ring or how powerful this signet ring is. I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt as Pharaoh was talking to Joseph. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Verse 44, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. Now that's how powerful the signet is um, in olden days. I'm not sure how powerful it is now. Uh, perhaps it is still of some power um, currently, but back then you can see the authority, the power of wearing a royal um, signet ring. So coming back, um, the significance of this um, signet ring here and its relations to the book of Haggai chapter 2 verse 20 is that there was a breakdown with the, in the relationship with God. And this was with, uh, with King Jehoiakim. But not just with King Jehoiakim, we also see breakdowns of relationship with God from other characters in the Bible in the Old Testament. So, before I go there, on that day, declares the Lord, I will take you again. Let me remind you, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Sheertail, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring. I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. So here God chose Zerubbabel to be his servant, his signet ring, restoring the Davidic line. Now, who are the other areas or characters that had, that had a broken relationship with God? So Adam and Eve, right? There was a broken relationship, but that relationship was, was restored through Jesus Christ. There was a broken relationship with the people uh, of the world, pure evil that God sent the flood, and there was restoration through Noah. There was also a broken relationship with Saul and was restored through King David. And finally, for this context, a broken relationship because of pure evil by King Jehoiakim. And this was then restored to, through Zerubbabel. Now we have to realize here that Zerubbabel is seen as a type of Christ, a true servant of God and God's chosen signet ring. Zerubbabel led the Israelites out of Babylon exile and Christ led us out from the bondage of sin. Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple of God and Christ is building the spiritual temple, the church. Christ is that signet ring and through whom all divine purposes are sealed through the Holy Spirit. After the final shaking of the nations, we shall receive a kingdom that cannot be moved and all nations shall walk in the light of God and he shall be all in all. And so before I wrap up, I'd like us to read Deuteronomy chapter 30. As Moses gathered all the leaders of Israel and gave God's command. Verse 2. When you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. And in verse 9 and 10, the Lord will again delight in you and make you prosperous, just as he delighted in your ancestors. If you obey the Lord with your, your God and keep his commands and decrees that are written in this book of the law and turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. So what does this mean for all of us? It means that God is mighty to accomplish all his plans. God will indeed shake the heavens and the earth and will bring the throne of the nations down and will send things right through our Lord Jesus Christ. And just as I mentioned earlier, as Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple, it also points to Jesus Christ building a spiritual temple, which is us, the church. As God made Zerubbabel his signet ring, 
The true signal ring is Christ himself, wherein and through whom all divine purposes are sealed through the Holy Spirit. So in essence, everything points to our Lord Jesus Christ. So in summary, our choices in life really matter. It's not that our choices in life doesn't really matter, but in this context here, give really careful thought to your ways, um, how you behave to people around you. Obedience of God's people need both heart and action, and it's part of how God works in this world. And once again, when we put God's kingdom's work above our own prosperity, he is pleased and glorified. His work gets done, and he truly blesses us. And I'll end with this um, verse. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, in the end, it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In the New Living Translation, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. Live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. And the verse that I go by on a daily basis, trust in the Lord with all your heart's heart and lead not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6. And so to all those who are serving in any capacity, it could be in ministries or even your own personal ministry outside, do remember to frequently check your motives, your hearts, and always persevere. And to those who would like to volunteer to serve in ministries, both existing ones and also new ones, be bold. It is the Spirit of God that communicates with our spirit. So as with Haggai chapter 1, when it says the Lord stirred up the Spirit, it was the Holy Spirit that did that. Therefore, obey and show reverence, then we are in a position for the Spirit of God to lead in our lives. Then we are going to produce fruit. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you asking for forgiveness. We humble our hearts and ask for your mercy. Times, Lord, sometimes daily, may we put our own personal endeavors a priority rather than your house and your kingdom. We're sorry, Lord, for taking side with worldly or materialistic um, wants, gains, all of which are very short-term in nature. And sometimes we fail to look at things eternal. I pray the Lord, even today, thank you for this reminder from the book of Haggai. Thank you, Lord, that you remind us that sometimes we need discipline in our lives, individually as well as corporately. We need to be just refreshed to draw close to you. And Lord, we know that you, are, you have never left us alone. You know the things that we go through. You know the trials, the, the brokenness, sometimes the feelings it is so down. But Lord, we want to hold on to you. We want to draw as close as we can to you. And we thank you, Lord, for that gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And through him, we've been given a direct path to you. Your Holy Spirit in us speaks on our behalf to you. And Lord, we truly cannot thank you enough for your grace, your daily mercies, and your love to all of us. And so Lord, like, like the book of Haggai, let us always look towards you, the hope eternal. Let us look towards your kingdom. Let us build your house. Instill in us this sense of passion and also um, urgency of importance to build your house. Let us, as a church in Bangsa, continue to be united with one another. Help one another. Encourage one another. Let us not give up meeting together as often as we can and always to keep all of us in prayer. So Lord, once again, we thank you. We thank you for this. 
two, two chapters in the book of Haggai. Simple, short books, but very deep in its meaning. And so, Lord, we thank you once again. In Jesus' name, amen.